Hi, and welcome back to the European VC, the go-to podcast for everything European VC. If you love the show, share it with your friends and join our newsletter at eu.vc. Today, we're happy to welcome Annie, managing partner at Cross Border Impact Ventures, an impact venture capital firm investing in health technology companies addressing large international markets. The firm focuses on expanding access to world-class technologies within North America and Europe, as well as to reach people living in emerging economies. Prior to founding cross-border impact ventures, Annie works with high-impact companies to mobilize more than $100 million in non-dilutive capital as a venture capital investor and advisor. If you enjoy our content, do support us by hitting the follow button, giving us a review and following the European VC on LinkedIn. Welcome to the European VC podcast. Today we have a special episode. Early last year, together with Uplink, a project by the World Economic Forum, EUVC launched a challenge for innovative investment funds with a focus across at least one of eight key SDG areas. Nature, ocean, plastics, climate action, circular economy, water, health, and education. This campaign was a partnership between Uplink, UVC, Eisenberg Capital, and other great names in venture, aimed to source and select innovative funds investing in purpose-driven startups around the world. Now, If you're a regular listener, you know that the European VC has always and will always be European focused. But saving our planet is too much of an important topic for us to just stand idle. So today, we're proud to present one of the 17 funds selected that is mobilizing capital for people and the planet. We are welcoming Annie, managing partner of Cross Border Impact Ventures, an impact venture capital firm focused on solutions, improving access to high quality healthcare for women, children, and adolescents. Annie, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Annie, let's start with the basics. Who the hell is Annie and how did you end up in what we like to term as the wonderful world of venture? A bit accidentally. I started my career in very traditional capital markets. My PhD is in financial engineering. So I I came at it from that sort of lens. and, And after the credit crisis of 2008, I really sort of fell into venture because the firm that I was at had some major restructurings and we ran a little sort of corner of the desk intellectual property fund that did, you know, a lot of different investing. We did uh, theatrical rights along with helping small companies fight bigger companies that were infringing on their patents and a little bit of venture. And I was one of a few people that stayed around at the firm and we raised a larger fund, uh, had more allocation to venture. And and that's kind of how it all started around 2011 and haven't really looked back. Today, I run my own firm and it's pretty exciting. So cross-border impact ventures, a couple of cool words in there. (laughs) What is that about? You know, where where does that come from? And, you know, I gave a quick kind of teaser into what y'all are focused on, but give us a rundown. It's quite interesting because the name uh, actually really sort of describe everything that we are about as a firm. And so what we like to do in our investing is really pick tech companies that are globally relevant. And the first fund that we're running today is healthcare focused. And as you mentioned, specifically within healthcare, we select technologies in the areas that impact the health of women, children, and adolescents. But what's quite unique is every investment we make is targeting companies that are aiming to be international early on in their growth pathways. A lot of the Traditional health tech companies will look to conquer, let's say, the U.S. market or Europe, and then eventually, often after the exit, think a little more globally, whereas our portfolio is a bit different. Most of our companies are already, uh, you know, they maybe uh, have a have presence in two or three European countries in the U.S., and they're expanding into Africa or India, but there's always an international element to everything that we do, and the sort of the expression cross-border really refers to the fact that That's our focus. We help companies expand across different borders. Impact is at the core of what we do. Our fund is SFDR Article 9 compliant, and it's something we're quite proud of. We have, for every investment that we make, we we model impact of the investment on women, children, and adolescents globally, and we report upon that to our LPs, and we provide a lot of hands-on support network connections to our companies to achieve both the sort of cross-border expansion and the impact piece of the growth path. Something we were quite um, passionate about, right, us UVC in this project was, you know, we are super passionate about venture. We are geeks for VC, you know, and we also do some LP investing through syndicate models. And that is basically us kind of 
making bets, right? And even though we care about impact, you know, we often find ourselves in this situation where we see impact being used almost as an excuse for lower performance, right? That was kind of something that we were super keen on ensuring in this project with the World Economic Forum Uplink, that they didn't become contesting things so that every single fund selected looked at things not as impact first returns after or the other way around, but that very much looked at it as they go hand in hand and they can empower each other. So I'd love to hear a bit talk about how you think about impact and how that informs your investment strategy and keeping in mind, right, delivering the returns to your LPs, obviously. Yeah, it's quite an interesting comment and one that we hear often. And the way we think about impact is really along the lines of the Gender Global uh, Impact Investor Network, which is really to say, if you're an investment product with fiduciary responsibility for financial performance, the reality is that Financial performance is necessary in everything that we do, and we target market returns for venture, for health technology, for everything that we do. The way that we think about impact is that it can support the growth strategy of a company. And so if you think of it, there's a couple of elements, like I said, our companies are all international. So if you think of greater impact in Europe, for example, uh, which will be more relevant to your audience, the only way that's achieved in health technology is by having more customers. <laughs> and so I, I fail to see where that's a contradiction. Your pricing strategy in healthcare in Europe is pretty well determined. So if you're looking at a contraceptive or if you're looking at a new medical device that assists childbirth or another technology that may address pelvic organ prolapse, all of these technologies have sort of a pricing strategy that fits within the healthcare system that they go. We always look for tools that are a little easier to use. So there's always positive health economics to everything that we do, which is a pretty standard VC approach. I don't really see that as being particularly, you know, something that should destroy financial performance. Or if you're looking at digital tools, they're always more cost effective. How you achieve more impact in a place like Europe is really about asking your management team to think a little bit more broadly to say, okay, if you're developing a tool for the whole population, have you tested it? on children? Have you tested it on women? What does it cost to do that to achieve greater impact? And by the way, greater financial return, because you're just going to have more customers for which the product applies. And so in healthcare, from my point of view, it just means that you just have to be a little more thoughtful about how you grow your company rather than trying to get from A to B with only focusing on low-hanging fruit, typically male patients. Can you help your company achieve broader market appeal by just being more thoughtful. I, I kind of have a question there and it might come off as a bit provocative, but it isn't <laughs> um, in the sense that you said as a healthcare investor, right, or investing in healthcare, that kind of need to look a bit deeper, right? And I'd love if you could either kind of expand a bit more on that or give some examples, right, to help our listeners understand. So I have the pleasure in this conversation to have started my uh, adventure in venture capital in the life sciences fund, right? So I, I feel like I know what you're talking about, but I just want to make sure that everyone, yeah. everyone follows here. If you're thinking a bit about life sciences, the typical clinical trial that will be developed and it applies to devices as well as life sciences investing will be sort of focused generally if it's even, you know, if you think of the drugs that were first developed for breast cancer, they were tested on males. And when we look at, you know, obviously some devices can only be tested on females. We just have different parts. But generally, you'll find one trial site in one region. You'll get the type of people that live in that region. What we'll do is we'll work with companies to have international arms to their trials when it's possible and to really think through if it's for the whole population, are you including enough women? Is the sample that you're testing on racially diverse? So we just ask companies to think a little bit more deeply when they develop uh, their trials or I said differently, when they come through our doors, we're way more excited when they mention these topics themselves that they've already been thinking about them. So it's not materially changing the way you do things. And ultimately, it's expanding the ability of the company to grow internationally post-exit. And so we see the return being aligned with being a little smarter about how you think about testing your technology. It's funny that you say that, Annie, because I had kind of earmarked a sentence from a website as, as something that I wanted to ask you to kind of deep dive a bit on. And, and, and I'm quoting now, which is a sentence that you have says, we invest with a gender and diversity lens. And my question was actually very much connected to how you just wrapped up your explanation just now, which is why the hell is that relevant from an investment standpoint? And, and you spoke about the potential exit and how that, you know, this, this different lens impacts that. Again, can you detail a bit more? Can you explain a bit more what you mean for non-specialized investors here? Maybe I'll pick on one acquirer. Argonon is quite an interesting acquirer in our sector. But if you look at their mission, vision, everything on their website, it's all about global growth. 
in women's health. And they're one company, but you know, we could pick on many others. If we're thinking of investing in a company where Organon is a potential buyer, the fact that our investee would have already established a footprint in countries where the African genome is more prevalent or the Indian genome is more prevalent uh, will give them confidence about that global growth. And ultimately, they obviously want to grow in the U.S. Everything, you know, if you've done life sciences investing or med tech investing, it's all about the U.S. That's the market that offers the greatest margin. And if you don't have, you know, a strong potential in your FDA approvals and all the rest for your health tech investment, it's pretty hard to think of a strong exit. So we work a lot with our companies, about, um, you know, with respect to the U.S. market. But the U.S. market is very diverse. And again, if your technologies are not tested on everybody, and, and I think everyone might be familiar with the pulse oximeter that is having a lot of challenges right now because it doesn't work on people with dark skin, we feel that ultimately it supports the exit. If you're developing things for the average, but it doesn't work for 10, 20 percent of the population or a greater percentage if you look globally, Globally at the potential market, you're limiting the opportunity for the tax. And so that's really the way that we work with companies. One could almost feel, based on what you just said, that you're more focused on the US, but I know that that is not true. <laughs> <laughs> so, to people that do know you, they know you're Canadian, right? But you're doing a lot of stuff globally. So, I'd love to hear you talk a bit about your geo focus, the different geographies that excite you, and obviously, Every single person listening to this podcast has a soft place in their heart for Europe. So I'd love to ask you to talk about Europe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So the firm is based in Canada. That's quite correct. We're about to expand our team and add a footprint in, on the European continent soon. And the fund itself, uh, we have a, a Canadian uh, structure and a Luxembourg structure. We selected the Luxembourg structure over other jurisdictions because it is a sort of a trustworthy jurisdiction. If folks are familiar with Mauritius or uh, the Caymans, there there are jurisdictions that certain investors can't invest in. And so Luxembourg really, uh, while it has more regulations, more hurdles, (laughs) uh, it is definitely a place where uh, that adds a lot of confidence amongst investors that are international. And in terms of our investments, we don't have a ton of restrictions. The fund is meant to be global, but the places in the world where we really look for our deal flow are throughout Europe, Israel, Canada, and the U.S. Uh, We do uh, receive deal flow from emerging markets from time to time. Uh, As I said, our fund has an impact goal specific for emerging markets. As a Canadian manager, what's kind of interesting, sometimes I get asked, like, what's local? Well, the Series AB, what I think of as local is wherever I can get to with one flight. To fly to Vancouver from Toronto is five hours. <laughs> to fly to London is four and a half, five hours, depending on the flight. And so, you know, anywhere where we can get to throughout Europe, the US or Canada, we see as kind of our local primary markets. And then beyond that, it's a little harder for us to get convinced, but certainly we're very comfortable investing in the European continent. We think it, it's about 30% of our pipeline today. On our first few investments, if the pipeline closes the way that we think it will today, three of our first six investments will be sort of based in, in Europe, if you include the UK within the European continent these days. Yeah, just there, I think it's good that we do a little kind of side note here, just so everyone understands. So you spoke about the pipeline, you didn't really speak about the portfolio, and I think it's important to highlight the timings of the fund as well. You've started investing recently, so you have a couple of deals done, but the big chunk of the deals that we'll start seeing out is now in 23, 24. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, that's correct. We've closed two last year. We've got one that's just closing in the next few weeks, hopefully, and another that has a signed term sheet. And so we're we're really looking in this fund. Uh, we're targeting about $100 million in total. Uh, we're a little over halfway there, uh, but we're really looking to do 10, 12 deals so that we can invest on average about $10 million per company, maybe a little less, a little more. But that's really the key parameters. So we tend to invest at the Series A B, although we don't really look at the world in this way. We, we, If it's a regulated technology, we look for companies to have achieved CE mark or FDA on at least one product so that they're commercializing, or uh, we look for one to 10 million of revenues if they're not a regulated technology. I have two questions there that I'm actually really interested in hearing your your thoughts because you are are slightly more late stage than what we typically have as guests here on our show, right? So that, that's interesting because it's slightly bit different. So my first question is more from a geo perspective. So when you look into your pipeline, where are you seeing the the exciting things coming from? Are you seeing it like concentrated in Berlin and London? Or are you seeing like unexpected places kind of coming up with interesting deals like in Eastern Europe, whatever? What are you seeing there? It's pretty broad because the companies we invest in, so if you think of, a, you know, if we pick on devices and diagnostics as one area in particular, 
uh, but also it would apply to software. Um, if you're looking for companies that have regulatory approvals on one product, these are pretty unique plays because as you know, for some devices, it'll be $50, $60 million of paid in capital before you have uh, those approvals. Uh, whereas our companies may spend typically less than $10 million in achieving that. Sometimes it's more, but if they've spent more, they've received a lot of grant funding. Yeah. As we see a lot of our companies, because they're global or international first, they'll have received grants from the European Commission, from, let's say, the Gates Foundation, or a lot of other players of that nature. So they're kind of special companies. So it's pretty spread out, I would say, where the companies are based. We've seen some from Eastern Europe in the maternal health space recently that are quite interesting. We see a lot from the typical places you, you'd assume. So Silicon Valley, Boston areas are, are good places for us to look at. Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver in the Canadian markets. A lot going on in London, Paris. We've seen a bit from Germany. Uh, these would be the more common. And Israel is also a productive place for us. It's pretty spread out. Yeah. We look at everything that fits our investment thesis. And in terms of sectors of interest, it's really sexual reproductive health, including reproductive cancers and topics around that. Uh, we look at maternal, newborn, and child health. But we also will look you know, to special companies that are more on the health infrastructure, software, or general health, like chronic diseases, where there's an angle of gender. So if you're looking, let's say, at autoimmune diseases, many of them are more prevalent in women or require a different solution in women, or, or they present differently, and, and it can be a lot of different uh, aspects of that. But within these sectors, I, we find pipelines sort of pretty broadly across the world. I'm assuming that in a lot of these deals that you're seeing, there is always like some kind of interaction between you and the earlier stage investors, and in some cases, even potential informal partnerships and networks that you know you want to have with these local and earlier stage players. And so I'm curious to ask you, you know, what have you seen in Europe? What have you seen in terms of any trend that you've spotted in terms of the profiles of the earlier stage VCs active in healthcare? There's also this tech side, right? Because when you go into the software slash infrastructure side, there's, there's a bigger disparity there in terms of profiles. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on what you've seen in the earlier stages on the VC side that kind of comes across your desk. We certainly get a lot more excited in a deal when there's earlier stage VCs involved. I can't emphasize uh, you know, if there's companies listening, having good seed stage investors really makes my life easier as a series <laughs> maybe, um, because they've cleaned up the cap tables, the paperwork. And so closing a transaction is a lot smoother. And so we, we really, truly value uh, the presence of early stage investors in our deals and co-investors. Like the ideal syndicates for us are, you know, when you have a group of early stage VCs that are following on and our co-investors include groups in the U.S. and Europe, I think. It particularly if, it, like if it's a European company, we certainly like to have more local investors, but also some U.S. investors because, you know, having a presence in the U.S. market, as we talked about earlier, is, is quite key for the exit. Trends that we've seen uh, in healthcare, we've certainly seen a lot of VCs in Europe focused on, you know, what my partner and I always try to figure out what this term really means, but the deep tech aspect <laughs> seems to be about the new buzzwords. And so we've seen a lot being done in that sector on the European continent in health. We've also seen, uh, and this is a little stronger in the UK than on the continent, a lot going on in femtech. And so whenever we look at femtech deals, we the UK market is a place that we look a lot. There's a lot going on with respect to imaging and anything to do with kind of a healthy delivery of a baby. So replacing the traditional forceps and sort of aiding the de delivery so you have less tearing going on in Europe. It's pretty well all over the place. What I will say is when you look at the technologies and tools that are being used in hospitals today for women, it's pretty dated. A lot of it has been invented, you know, 100 years ago or 50 years ago, and it's not been innovated. But what we're seeing that excites us is there's just a lot of new things going on. So for our fund, it's sort of hard to say there's specific VCs that cover our whole area, but we are seeing a lot of different players across different sub-segments of what interests us. So I will not deep dive on the topic of what the hell is deep tech. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, because we asked a bunch of VCs and the answer was very different. It was, it was, you know. Well, I have to say, you know, I really like, and I don't think we have launched this episode yet, so our listeners, more recurrent listeners, don't even know what I'm referring to. But I like the way IQ Capital uh, out of the UK defines it. And I'll leave that as a teaser to anyone interested in hearing that. That episode will come out. But yeah, it's a huge topic and different people define it in different ways. What I wanted to ask you, though, is, 
I was between brackets or whatever, educated within like a drug development focused fund, right? Mm -hmm. And that means that the GPs were technical slash scientific experts, right? They really understood the underlying technology. They really understood the R&D side, but as well the regulatory side. And something I've been seeing, and I wanted to ask your opinion, because I'm not sure what I think right, about it, is, as you said, these more deep tech focused emerging GPs and so on, or AI focused or ML focused, kind of investing in a lot of applied technology to the healthcare sector. And I always wonder if they truly understand the regulatory hurdles, as an example, that are associated to doing investments in this space. So I'd love to hear if you have any, any loose thoughts on this topic or any more kind of structured thoughts as well. I would say what we've seen from kind of the earlier stage GPs is a lot more scientists, if we can call them that. So there's two camps, you know, some of the very deep tech focused or, or, you know, if they're life science specific funds, they'll come at it from that lens. Uh, We come at it more from a commercialization lens and growth of the company. So from our perspective, what you know, as we think of building syndicates, it's always interesting to us when a deal is brought to us by one of these sort of more technical teams, if we can call them that. And we look at it, like I said, more from a commercialization. The way we get at the technical analysis is we've built, a, you know, a really deep bench of experts uh, in healthcare. We have a scientific advisory board that are some of the smartest individuals around with respect to women's health or, or newborn child health or individuals that can evaluate clinical trial designs, IP, and that sort of thing. But we really focus on the commercialization, and then we bring in experts as needed with respect to the detailed science that goes behind an investment. The the more, you know, I've been doing this for a while, the, the more you invest, what you realize is your expertise only goes so far. You need to have others around the table, a lot of call a friend, if you will, Uh, to validate an investment thesis, particularly in the sectors where we're in, because it's really ultimately what we try to do is invest in tools that will be ready for market within the next few months and available and growing while we manage the investment. And so it's quite important that we have a good view of the commercialization pathway of a new technology. If I am an early stage GP investing in startups that cross over in some way or form, what cross-border impact is doing, what should I do? How can I reach out? I'm checked my LinkedIn very frequently. So that's a good place. Or uh, We have our info email on the website that I monitor. So I'm pretty easy to reach. I, I've always had a policy. A lot of people you know, don't take cold calls, but I've, I've always had a policy that I, I do. It's just who I am. If someone takes the time to write me a note, one that's not too long, because I don't have a lot of attention span. <laughs> you know, Quick paragraph, I'd like to connect with you. Uh, I'll, I'll always make time and love to meet new potential investors, collaborators, new companies. So definitely easy to reach me. As a funny side note, it's like LinkedIn is this funny thing where you either get those like super short generic messages that like you can clearly see it with a copy paste or you get these like huge testaments where you can't even muster the courage to start reading. The beauty of, of keeping it in the middle, like short and sweet to the point and concrete is like is, is beautiful. And I just realized I made a rhyme there. <laughs> Annie, yeah. we always end our episodes with a quick fire round. Okay. This is when we add ask quick answer questions, 30 to 60 seconds each. Are you ready for it? Sure, go ahead. So the first one will be an easy one for you. And that is what areas, technologies or sectors excite you the most that other people around you don't really feel that excited about? I would say everything to do with, with our fund <laughs> sometimes. Uh, we invest in sexual and reproductive health and maternal and newborn child health. So these are quite specific topics that we couldn't be more excited about because they're just ready to be disrupted. The tools and technologies that are being used generally suck. If you're a woman who's ever had forceps used on you, let me count the ways you never want to go through that again. And there's new technologies to improve uh, women's health care in all these areas. So we're really quite excited about that. Second question of the quick fire is what are your top tips for emerging GPs who are fundraising? Keep following up. Now is often and not now. So one of the things that has been productive for me is to keep people updated. Priorities of potential LPs change over the course of time. And a piece of advice that was given to me that proved out to be true is the folks that you think will invest in your fund for sure are not necessarily those who will ultimately invest. And those that you think early on will never invest can invest. And so keeping in touch with people and having a long-term view is really key. It's definitely a marathon, not a sprint. We ask this in every episode and persistence often comes up and you are basically saying that <laughs> persistence and keeping people up to date and informed. Yeah, you might say pain tolerance. Is another <laughs> 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 persistence. 
<laughs> pain tolerance. I think there, there's some data out there that women are better at that than men, right? <laughs> In terms of to- tolerating pain, right? <laughs> yeah. I always tell my friends that I mean, keep your positive panties on uh, through the whole thing because you're going to need them. <laughs> I love that. I love that. That's going to be the segment of this episode that we will cut out to use for, for the market. <laughs> keep your positive panties. I love it. Third and final question, Annie. What's the most counterintuitive thing you've learned since you've been in venture? It's not necessarily a counterintuitive, but more an oxymoron, if we can call it that. Every LP wants to invest in a fund because you're the special fund versus others. Yet the only way you make money as a VC is to have good co-investors and good partners in co-investing with you. Any VC that tells you that they're the only one who made the success of the company single-handedly is full of shit. Uh, And so it's a very strange observation, I think, you know, even down to for the GPs, you know, the LPs evaluate that you have a good GP team, you know, good people working with you. And then they want this breakdown of which partner did what deal Yet all decisions are made by the team. It's never, you know, if you have a good GP team, it's not one person making the investment decision if you're really working collaboratively as a group. And so there's these sort of strange patterns that are, you know, just it's hard to wrap your head around it sometimes. That couldn't be more in line with our ethos here at the European VC. We're community focused, right? And venture works, as you said, it's a network, right? We need each other. We need our co-investors. We need our partners. We need we need a bunch of people around us to make things happen. So Annie, thank you for ending it on that note. I enjoyed having you here today on EUVC. To our listeners, Andreas had a bit of technical issues in the beginning of this recording. And so Annie was stuck with me. I hope it was good. I hope you enjoyed it. Annie, I hope to see you again soon as well. Perfect. Thank you. It was great to be here. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode of The European VC, the go-to podcast for everything European VC. If you love the show, share it with your friends and join our newsletter at eu.vc. 